There is no professor to introduce this professor. <laughs> it's Magrenka Sir, who has been with the Pekawa for since its inception. And um, as Newton professor at MIT, he's going to be talking about cortical plasticity. Uh, thank you very much, Morgan. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be a member of the Picard Institute and talk about some of our progress in the last uh, 20 years. Um, my lab has worked for a long time on cortical plasticity, and we know a little bit about the cerebral cortex of the brain. We know where it is. Some of us use it. <laughs> and the cerebral cortex occupies 80% of the brain in you and me. But it's not soup. It's organized into discrete brain regions that carry out well-defined processing operations. We have been interested in how the cortex gets wired in order to carry out its functions. And the impressive thing about the cortex is that despite its neurons, and each neuron has up to 10,000 synapses, so that's 80 trillion synapses in the brain, uh, 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 because the brain has 80 billion, the, the cortex has 80 billion with the B neurons, the cortex wires itself using mechanisms that depend on developmental time and Cortical areas and pathways, the large-scale connections between areas form early by intrinsic influences for the most part, but then synapses and circuits consolidate later and are shaped by mechanisms of plasticity. And these mechanisms continue into adulthood as mechanisms of learning and memory. And that's what we study. So before there was a Picower Institute, there was a Center for Learning and Memory that Suzumu started in the late 1990s. And I believe Suzumu, Matt, Earl, and me formed the Center for Learning and Memory by 2000. And those were really fun times because we talked a lot about how the center should be shaped and we joined hands with Suzumu in the formation of the Picower Institute. The questions that have shaped my lab's work are the following. How does plasticity shape the formation of cortical circuits? How does learning engage cortical mechanisms of plasticity? How do neuromodulators, which are ancient molecules that flood the brain, influence learning plasticity and brain states? And finally, in a kind of a culmination of the basic knowledge that we, that we gleaned, how are cortical circuits affected in disorders of brain development? And I will leave with you uh, uh, our work on one disorder, Rett syndrome, for which our work on plasticity has led to a therapeutic molecule that has made its way through phase one, phase two, and last December, phase three trials, and is now up at the FDA for approval, and ap approval is expected this year as the first molecule for a devastating brain disorder that comes out of fundamental neuroscience. So, so the first experiment that we published after I joined Suzumu's Center for Learning and Memory had to do with an experiment that we started even before that, when I first came to MIT. And it was an experiment in which we asked a kind of a simple-minded question that only a beginning assistant professor kind of person can ask, which is, what if we can rewire the brain? Can we make one part of the brain behave like another? And so to do that, we made visual inputs, which normally go to visual centers of the brain and hence to the visual cortex. We rewired the brain such that visual inputs went to the auditory centers of the brain. The auditory centers normally receive input from the ears and then through auditory structures project to the hearing cortex. But now in these experiments, we made visual input project to the auditory and hence to the hearing cortex. These experiments were done in ferrets. This is a wonderful painting by Leonardo da Vinci that hangs in the Chateau Risky Museum in Krakow. I actually went to Krakow to take this picture 
uh, I kid you not. And, and, and it's a wonderful picture. Along the way to the museum, there are ripoffs of this that line the, 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 that people are trying to sell. But here's what we found. So why ferrets? Because ferrets are born very early in development at the state that is similar to the first trimester of birth in humans. We can take newborn ferrets, we can remove the inputs that go from the auditory midbrain to the auditory thalamus. It took us 20 years to find out why the experiment works. This, this procedure alters gene expression in the auditory thalamus so that the auditory thalamus now expresses some genes, such as ZIK1 and ZIK4, that are normally expressed in the visual cortex. But that change in gene expression makes retinal inputs that normally grow right past the auditory thalamus now enter the auditory thalamus and provide a new pathway by which the eye drives the hearing cortex. We let these animals grow up and we ask, what did this do? and it transforms the auditory cortex and makes it into a visual cortex. Normally, the visual cortex has neurons that respond to one orientation or the other of light, and they are organized in a systematic map. The rewired auditory cortex that was never made to see also has orientation selective cells that are also organized into a map, somewhat cruder, but a map nonetheless. And why? Because the connections that link neurons that are of similar orientation are clustered in the visual cortex. In the auditory cortex of normal animals, these connections link neurons of the same sound frequency. But in the rewired auditory cortex, these connections, these circuits get completely transformed and they link neurons of the same orientation. I remind you that the cortex, the visual or the auditory cortex, has no direct knowledge of the outside world. All the knowledge that it has is present in the electrical firing of the inputs that project to that cortex. From that electrical activity in space and time, the cortex builds a circuit that processes that input, right? So the deepest question in our field is how it is that electrical activity shapes synapses and circuits. And, the, and a long-standing rule going back 70 years goes back to Donald Hebb who said, Neurons that fire together wire together. But unregulated Hebbian plasticity can lead to unstable assemblies because if one neuron takes part in firing another neuron, you strengthen that connection, but then serendipitously, now this neuron is firing more and it will transiently link with other neurons and hence everybody will be firing together and sitting at the ceiling. So we need to renormalize synaptic weights. And one way to renormalize is by a procedure called synaptic scaling that Gina Turigiano and others have, uh, uh, have proposed. But this is neuron-wide. A mechanism we favor, in addition, is called locally coordinated plasticity, where locally on dendrites, when one synapse goes up, another synapse must come down to preserve the total strength of synapses within some, within some range. And we have discovered such mechanisms and the molecules underlying them. How did we do that? Samuel Bustani and Jacques Ibb did the following experiment, shown here very schematically. If we can devise a way by which in the live mouse brain, we can strengthen certain synapses by showing light at their receptive fields and followed by making the postsynaptic cell fire by a procedure called spike timing dependent plasticity. If we strengthen known synapses, can we show that other synapses that are not strengthened will in fact weaken such that within a local dendrite, the overall input current is conserved? Indeed, that's what we find. So shown here in red are synapses that we potentiated or that show structural LTP. Structure and function go together in the visual cortex synapses. When we potentiate certain synapses, other synapses within the vicinity of them go down, shown in green, so that potentiated and depressed synapses in function and in structure lie in close proximity. And we can show that by measuring their strength and their size. When one synapse goes up, another synapse within, a, within 50 microns has gone down. How has this happened? It has happened 
that we showed using constructs made by Hiroyuki Okuno and, and Bito, that when synapses get stronger, they express more glutamate receptors or more AMPA receptors. And when synapses get weaker, they express more ARC, which is a molecule that has been known for a long time. And so then when larger synapses, stronger synapses have more AMPA receptors, larger synapses have less ARC, so that potentiated synapses have less ARC, more AMPA receptors, depressed points have more ARC, less AMPA, and they lie in close proximity because this molecule is floating back and forth or is being expressed in one while it gets de-expressed in the other. Plasticity shapes cortical circuits during development, as I've been telling you, via unsupervised learning. And this takes us into the computational ideas of learning that has also uh, 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 shaped my lab's work over the last decade or so. But plasticity alters circuits in adulthood via supervised and reinforcement learning. Here's an example of reinforcement learning. If we are at a traffic light and we see uh, a green light, even if it is foggy, we make a decision based on this percept, and then we act, and we go if it's green, if the light is green. We were not born knowing this, we learned this, we are reinforced on this, and it's crucial to our life that we learn this. Mice can be taught this too. So here's a mouse, uh, and it is taught that when a horizontal bar appears, followed by a delay, that's a go signal, and it should lick, and it does. And it's taught that when a vertical bar appears, that's a no-go signal. And after a delay, when the lick spout comes forward, the mouse does not lick. So that, that's a hit, that's a correct reject, and the mouse can make mistakes as well. And the idea is, as we teach this mouse, so my students are like circus trainers. They can train these mice to do amazing things. Not write Shakespeare yet, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but we can ask what has changed in the brain from a sensory area such as visual cortex through a transformational area like parietal cortex to an anterior motor cortex area that we think should represent the consequences of learning in a profound way. And we do this by techniques that you have already heard from Jerry, which is multiphoton imaging at high resolution of the neuronal responses that are expressing calcium indicators. Each of these flashes is a blink or is, is a activation or a spiking of a neuron. From such activity, we can decipher what happens in visual parietal or, or, or anterior motor cortex as the animals are presented the stimulus during the delay and when they are allowed to lick or not lick. And what we find is that there are remarkable learning-induced plasticity changes in the anterior motor cortex. So right when the stimulus comes on, the neuron's activity shoots forward from the visual cortex, which senses horizontal versus vertical bars. It shoots forward to the motor cortex and sits there during the delay. We believe because it is the action plan. Should I lick or should I not lick? That is the working memory of this task. And then when the mouse is allowed to register its action, then it licks or not. And we can actually analyze this in the high dimensional space. If there are 80 billion neurons, as you heard from Earl, those 80 billion neurons represent, contribute a little bit to a lot of stuff. That's a very high dimensional space. In our task, we can record from a few hundred neurons and we can ask, can we nonetheless decipher the high dimensional representation by its imprint on lower dimensional representations? So in the visual cortex, the answer is of course yes. There are two kinds of neurons. One neuron re re responds to horizontal bars, another set of neurons responds to vertical bars, and that's what Hubel and Wiesel showed us 80 years ago. So V1 activity reflects visual stimulus features. Learning does not change them. You need something stable in the brain to interpret the incoming sensory information and form the percept. But then, in the anterior motor cortex, something remarkable happens. What happens is that there's a population of neurons that comes to represent the task, and it does so even in the low dimensional space of two dimensions. 
So here's the set of neurons, 400, 300 neurons, that activates in one way when the stimulus comes on, holds the action plan in memory, and then responds in a manner that says, now, I have frozen, but you saw the, <laughs> but you saw the, 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 the main point is this, is the same set of neurons that has these two modes of activity. These neurons were not made to fire this way. A mouse is not born trying, uh, 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 deciphering horizontal from, from vertical orientations. When we teach them, the synapses change such that not only do single synapses change, but the entire population now comes to represent what is critical for this mouse. Here are vertical versus horizontal orientations. I should now lick when I can, and then the same neurons provide a signal, now go lick, and downstream structures can read that out. Morgan is threatening me with two minutes. <laughs> I hired Morgan. Okay, anyway, and <laughs> look. Sulumu and I. Look what this man does. OK. Uh, learning is importantly shared by neuromodulators. One of them is norepinephrine. You have heard of dopamine. What does norepinephrine do? Norepinephrine spreads throughout the cortex and has crucial effects on learning. So Vincent and Gabby did the experiment that has just been published in which they trained a mouse on graded stimulus evidence low tones to high tones, high frequency means go, low frequency means don't go. The mouse learns as the frequency, as the tone intensity goes up, it lips more and more, but occasionally it makes a mistake like I showed you in the other task. How is it that the mouse's brain integrates information from this world, from this artificial world, in order to learn? I should lick here and not lick here. And the amazing thing that they found is that when the mouse makes a mistake, when it licks when it shouldn't, which is called a false alarm, after, then it gets a punishment. That punishment is a very strong training signal for the mouse. Since I couldn't be heard, I have another five minutes. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what does this, how is it that a mistake is a learning signal? They record it from the norepinephrine neurons, and they find that before the mouse moves, there is a blip of norepinephrine. But then after the mouse is, has moved, it's rewarded. The more the intensity of the tone, the more the mouse knows I'm going to be rewarded. The less is the uncertainty, and the lower is the norepinephrine. But when the mouse makes a mistake, it moved because it was expecting a reward and it got buzzed, it got punished, and the norepinephrine shoots up, saying, you made a mistake, you learned from this, and that's what norepinephrine does. That norepinephrine provides a post-reinforcement signal that signals surprise. In 30 seconds, I will tell you how do we bring all this together to understand a brain disorder. There are many developmental brain disorders. They have many genetic causes. The Simons Foundation, had, along with NIH, has spent a lot of effort in trying to decipher, do gene discovery. There are a thousand genes that we suspect underlie developmental disorders. My lab, for the last 15 years, has studied one disorder, Rett syndrome, which has one gene that, when mutated, causes the disorder. It's a rare disorder. It happens in only one in 10,000 births. It happens mainly in girls because the gene lives on the X chromosome, and when you have one X and uh, when you have two X chromosomes, one gene is mutant, but the other allele is normal, so girls are mosaic for mutant MECP2. Boys have one X and one Y, and when the MECP2 on the X chromosome is mutant, boys don't make it, or they have a very devastating condition called congenital encephalitis. It's a devastating disorder. There are many, many symptoms, but every family that I've met of a girl who has Rett syndrome says, I wish my girl would say mother or mom, because they lose language, and it's totally devastating. Last slide. What have we done? How have we brought our knowledge 
of plasticity to bear on understanding and even treating Rett syndrome. We start with the gene. There is a mouse that actually my collab long-term collaborator, Rudolf Jenisch, made, but there are other people who have made a knockout mouse. We apply our knowledge of plasticity, and we discovered through many, many papers that what has happened in these mice, one thing that has happened is that there is a significant, significant deficit in a critical signaling molecule called BDNF or IGF-1, for which there are specific receptors and, and, and then subsequent signaling, which leads to immature excitatory synapses and excessively plastic circuits. Normally, there is a critical period for at least visual cortex development, which ends or which slows down as the mouse develops. In these mice, that never happens. They continue to be hyperplastic. But we can make these synapses mature by giving them molecules that enhance PI3K AKT signaling. What are these molecules? Recombinant human IGF-1 or IGF-1 peptide. These molecules cross the blood-brain barrier and are available in the brain. And so we have proposed these molecules as potential therapeutics, both of which went into clinical trials very quickly after we proposed them in 2009, and out of which one molecule, the IGF-1 peptide, through a company with which I'm not associated, we gave away all this information, has gone through phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, and we expect that IGF-1 IGF peptide with two methyl groups added so that it's bioavailable longer, will be approved as the first therapeutic for any neurodevelopmental disorder this year. I want to thank my present lab members and the people who have been in my lab whose work I have mentioned. I am very privileged to have such outstanding past and present lab members, and we have had many collaborations, maybe 50 of them, out of which four are listed here. And of course, I want to thank the Picard Institute for so many funding means that have enabled this work, including the IGF-1 work on Rett syndrome started with funding at some point from the Picard, is it the Neuro Discovery Fund? I, I forget what, what all these acronyms are, but they are wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Migrenka. Um, yeah, we have time for a few questions, especially you. since you hired me. Oh, my me. goodness. <laughs> I, I, have, I have shamed Morgan into giving me more time. Thank you, Morgan. Over there. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, uh, I've heard of your research of uh, rewiring um, the visual cortex into the auditory input. Uh, did you follow in that line of research, or uh, do you think it would work the other way around, for example? Well, Thank you. It, it went both forward and backward in the following way. After we showed that initial example, I actually had a collaboration with Suzumu's lab where we showed that a kind of uh, auditory evoked fear conditioning could now be evoked by visual stimuli because of the projection from the eye into the auditory thalamus, which normally projects to the amygdala, and now carries visual information, and hence we could evoke this novel function. So there were so many gain-of-function experiments that were proof of concept that the brain really relies on its inputs in order to wire itself and create function. But then we decided to move into simpler paradigms for understanding molecular mechanisms of plasticity. And that included a classic lid suture paradigm and visual deprivation paradigms, and that led us into screens and mechanisms by which synapses change and circuits get shaped. A final question from the front row. output to electrodes in the somatosensory cortex, normally that interprets tactile stimuli. And the chimpanzee was able to see and differentiate numbers and letters with his camera going to the somatosensory cortex. So how close are we to having a neuroprosthetic device for people who've lost their eyes to provide artificial vision? That's a very good question. There's actually a lot of work going on in this field for both 
into the brain and out of the brain. Into the brain meaning if you have lost your eyes, then can a camera pick up enough information but then stimulate the cortex in the right way that we understand because the cortex is not only does it have a topographic map, but it, but it has all these circuits of excitatory and inhibitory neurons and edge detectors and more complex constructions of the visual image. So it is not a trivial issue. How do you tap into that with this knowledge of cortical physiology and circuitry in order to recreate vision from a camera? But it's definitely not that if you just put a grid of electrodes on the cortex and you stimulate them in the, in the way that the grid is being stimulated in the eye's camera that you will see. In fact, what you see are little dots of light. They are called phosphenes. The other way has been more successful, where you can record the activity of brain cells, say in the motor cortex, if somebody unfortunately has spinal cord damaged. One of the amazing things about the brain is that connections don't regrow. So can you stimulate muscles or things distal to the cut or even a robotic arm such that your brain can bring things to you? Much more progress on that, and we can talk about it later. Okay, so since that guy over there has had his hand up for a long time, I will allow that question, and then we're gonna break for lunch. Thanks, uh, it's a really quick question. So uh, from what you showed, uh, it seems that Rett syndrome seems to manifest itself around the so-called critical period of plasticity. So do we know anything about uh, how the development of neuromodulatory systems uh, could be implicated in, in Rett syndrome? So just to clarify, Rett syndrome in humans with Rett syndrome really begins to be manifest around two or three years of age. So to that extent, to the extent that we can call it a critical period, though I think that the critical period for humans is a much more complex idea. Uh, our ideas come from critical periods in the mouse visual cortex. But to answer your actual question, neuromodulatory systems are hugely influenced by mutation of the MECP2 gene, and there is a literature on that. So we do think that affecting neuromodulatory systems will have some impact. Okay, thank Thanks. you.